Well, good afternoon and welcome everyone to this presentation, uh, Thriving People, Thriving Planet and Thriving Businesses, the Biden administration, the 117th Congress and the outdoor recreation economy. My name is Rich Harper. I'm the Director of Government Affairs for Outdoor Industry Association based in our nation's capital of Washington, DC. Although today I'm speaking to you from my home residence in Bethesda, Maryland. I'm proud to be joined by my colleagues today for this discussion. Amy Horton, our Senior Director of Sustainable Business Innovation at OIA. George Cooper, a partner at Forbes Tate and our outside government relations consultant. Jeannie Renee Malone, VP of Global Sustainability for VF Corp. Taldi Harrison, Government and Community Affairs Manager for REI. And Mike Ratchford, Government Relations Associate for WL Gore and Associates. It goes without saying that the 2020 elections was one of the most consequential uh, in US history, um, particularly for the outdoors and the outdoor recreation economy. It was heartening and inspiring to see so many outdoors get out and vote in support of the outdoor agenda. And we've seen the fruits of that advocacy and participation with the Biden administration on day one committing to rejoin the Paris Climate Accord. And we have the opportunity with this new administration and new Congress to advance our priorities across our policy agenda from combating climate change through the work of our Climate Action Corps, representing the business voice in support of the administration's initiatives on climate to building on the success of the Great American Outdoors Act and making new investments to preserve our public lands and waters through a civilian conservation corps supporting a 30 by 30 initiative supporting close to home recreation, green infrastructure, and also promoting supporting equity and diversity in the outdoors. To finally promoting a stable and predictable federal trade policy uh, for outdoor businesses who have been hit by trade wars, by punitive tariffs, and the uncertainty of what comes next. They wanna get back to doing what they do best, developing innovative new gear to enhance the outdoor experience. But ultimately, we understand that for our businesses to thrive, the outdoors has to thrive. And I'm thrilled to be joined today by a friend and ally of the outdoors to begin this conversation, Senator Martin Heinrich from New Mexico. Senator Heinrich has served New Mexico in the U.S. Senate since 2013. Prior to that, on the Albuquerque City Council and in the U.S. House of Representatives. He is a leading conservationist and sportsman in the U.S. Congress, and I should add, a 2016 OIA Friend of the Industry Award recipient. He is a member of the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee, where he is a leader on getting the Great, Amer Great American Outdoors Act through. And we also want to thank him for his leadership on passing America's Conservation Enhancement Act. He is no stranger to the outdoor retailer show. And if you spotted him at the show in Denver, you know he's not as he is now in his DC attire, but he is truly a friend of the outdoors. He's truly uh, one of us. So to begin this conversation, I'm excited to turn it over to Senator Heinrich from New Mexico. Senator Heinrich. Thank you, Rich, and hi, everyone. I really want to thank the Outdoor Industry Association for giving me the opportunity to share a few thoughts with you today on how the new Congress, the new Biden administration, uh, including my fellow New Mexican uh, and hopefully our next Interior Secretary, Congresswoman Deb Holland, can all work together to expand outdoor opportunities. Um, a lot of you know me, but if you don't, my commitment to our great outdoors and our shared public spaces is deeply personal. I've spent my entire adult life working to protect our public lands and wildlife uh, before I ever ran for public office, I worked as an AmeriCorps member for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service on the uh, Mexican Wolf Program. Uh, I was an outfitter guide leading trips for large, mostly kids into the backcountry all over the Southwest. And I spent years fighting alongside local coalitions in my home state of New Mexico to protect treasured landscapes, open up new public access, and establish new designations. I was so proud to help lead the bipartisan negotiations that led to the passage of the historic Great American Outdoors Act last year, and particularly to secure the inclusion of those other public lands in that infrastructure package. Um, I fought really hard to make sure that it wasn't just a park service bill, but also 
uh, infrastructure for the Bureau of Land Management, for the Forest Service, and for the national refuge lands that, that constitute so much of the recreational base uh, and habitat in our country. This new law is the greatest investment in opening up new access and rebuilding infrastructure on our nation's public lands and waters that we've seen in generations. That we were able to pass this major multi-billion dollar investment in our outdoor spaces with a large bipartisan majority and with Donald Trump in the White House shows that it is still possible to find consensus and do big things for the places that we all treasure. This is in no small part because of the engagement of so many Americans who enjoy getting outside and those of you whose businesses help all of us get outside. Uh, I'm eager for us to confirm Congresswoman Deb Holland as our next Interior Secretary so that we can keep working to expand outdoor opportunities and protect our natural heritage. Um, I do not want to minimize what we are up against, however. Our public lands and waters face existential changes due to climate change. And the Trump administration spent much of the last four years rolling back key conservation rules and environmental protections and opening up landscapes for development. The Biden administration will obviously have its hands full simply reversing some or hopefully much of that damage. But I would challenge each of us to think so much bigger and demand so much more than just that. Uh, I strongly believe that outdoor recreation and our public lands can and should play a major role in our national recovery. Uh, we can put millions of Americans back to work building new opportunities to get outside. Implementation of the Great American Outdoors Act will help us do just that. It will also create long lasting benefits for generations to come. And when you, when you just look around at the many places that still benefit to this day from the trails and roads and visitor centers built by the New Deal CCC crews nearly a century ago. It shows what's possible. And I hope we can make real progress in addition on expanding public access to our public lands, including passing my SOAR Act, the Simplifying Outdoor Access for Recreation Act, that would make it easier for permits um, for, for groups, educational groups, outfitter guides, to secure their permits on public lands. Uh, we also have a real opportunity under the leadership of this new administration to reorient the driving missions of our federal land management agencies. Uh, we need a modern vision for public land management that is rooted in conservation and in solving the climate crisis. Uh, Americans value our public lands for what they provide us in terms of outdoor recreation and clean water, environmental justice, climate solutions, the preservation of our wildlife and rural economic development. And those are not always the benefits that our, our federal land managers and these agencies have prioritized. And I think we need a reset there. Uh, the time for measuring the value of our public uh, lands or natural resources simply in barrels or board feet has passed by. Uh, the mission of our public land management agencies should be focused on serving the American public and conserving the common lands and waters that we all love. And I think one of the, uh, the other things uh, that it is important for us to realize is we need a national recreation plan. Uh, I hope to work with all of you uh, to craft legislation and to work with the new administration to encourage an approach that really brings the Department of Interior and the US Forest Service together around a common agreement about uh, uh, to, to plan for recreation on our public lands. Uh, and finally, uh, I'm really quite excited to be working with a, uh, a, a brand new organization called the Outdoor Future, which is a coalition of racially and ethnically diverse organizations who are going to be leading a conversation about how we really meet, um, bring the outdoor benefits that so many of us have taken for granted to every single community in our country. So we have so much work to do. We have so many opportunities right now. And I, I want you all to think of me as a resource 
And I can guarantee you, I'm gonna be thinking of you as a partner to help get some of these things moving legislatively, as well as inside this new uh, Biden administration. And with that, I'm really looking forward to having a conversation with all of you here today. Well, thank you, Senator Heinrich, for those uh, comments. We're excited to work with you and your team on, on behalf of the outdoors and the outdoor recreation economy. And it sounds like we'll have a full agenda uh, with you this year. So really excited to, to get to work. Um, now I wanna bring on board uh, our government relations consultant, George Cooper um, from Forbes Tate, who's been working with us over the past year. He's gonna give an overview of the 2020 election uh, and what this means for the outdoors and maybe a sneak peek ahead uh, to 2022 uh, as well. And I think this presentation, George, will be just a little bit different than the one we did last uh, November with the results of the Georgia Senate runoffs on January 5th. So uh, with that, uh, we'll bring aboard George. Thanks, Rich. Uh, you know, it's always interesting to give a presentation of what Congress is gonna be doing when you have a US Senator literally staring at you through your computer screen. I'm sure Senator Heinrich will catch me where I'm going wrong. And I just wanna say one other thing about Senator Heinrich, you know, um, his role in seeing the Great American Outdoors Act through is was just one of many things he was doing over the course of the past two years or so. Um, through sheer for, force of will and brilliant strategic thinking, we racked up a lot of conservation wins in the last Congress at a time where, you know, people like me who pontificate and try to predict didn't see us having much of a chance of doing anything in, in the last Congress and ended up being one of the best uh, sessions of Congress we've ever had for conservation and outdoor recreation. So I, you know, he is our leader in the U.S. Congress, and as long as he is there in the U.S. Senate, we can continue doing great things for outdoor recreation and conservation. Um, so I'm just going to take us through, Rich mentioned, I think when a lot of folks gathered today, last convened, we were uh, taking a look at what might happen in November. Uh, a lot of things happened we expected, some things happened that we didn't necessarily expect, uh, but we find ourselves sitting here today with very narrow uh, margins, but Democratic control of both the House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate. And so you can just see in those, those graphical representations, we're, we're right down the middle. Literally, as we look at the Senate, where Senator Heinrich is, is living in, in this bizarre continuing uh, COVID Congress. Um, over in the House, um, I think I'm going to spend a minute there because it's getting a little less attention. All the focus is on the Senate right now and uh, Senator Schumer and Senator McConnell trying to work out some sort of an agreement on how to manage day-to-day -day operations of the U.S. Senate with a 50-50 majority. It's really important to keep in mind in the House that, you know, the majority controls what comes to the floor and, you know, can, can pretty much be passing things through uh, that leadership uh, wants to move through. Um, but the narrower that majority becomes, the harder it is for them to do that. And so I think the, the main thing to keep in mind here is having such little, if almost zero margin for error on votes uh, really is, is going to cause Nancy Pelosi to have to think differently about what she brings to the floor in terms of, of having security of knowing it'll pass, um, but also not putting uh, the moderate Democrats in her caucus in awkward positions. Um, that's where Democrats really um, lost um, badly in terms of having a lot of moderate pro-business, blue dog, new Democrat style Democrats. Uh, uh, those, those, those members uh, um, had tough races and many of them did not come back. But that's not to say there aren't still plenty of moderate Democrats there and they're gonna have more leverage uh, than they had before. Uh, over the Senate, it's pretty simple. It's 50-50. Um, of course, you do have Senator Sanders and Senator King technically as independents, but caucusing with the Democrats. And as I said, and Senator Heinrich can speak to this in more of an up-to-the-minute up to fashion, um, there's been a negotiation going on now uh, for at least a couple of days between McConnell and Schumer about a power-sharing agreement. And um, the thing holding things up right now, the main thing, I guess I should say, is Senator McConnell wanting some sort of guarantee from Senator Schumer that Democrats will not attempt to um, do away fully or partially or you know, eat further into the filibuster. 
we'll see if they figure something out there. But, you know, <clears throat> as a practical matter, that's speculating too much on that. I think, I think a key thing to think about in the Senate is you're going to have committees operating basically more sort of 50 50. You're not going to have uh, uh, the, the, you know, Democrats having significantly more numbers on committees than they, as they typically would in a traditional majority, but you are going to have Democratic chairs running these, these committees. Uh, Rich, when we go to the next slide. Um, just a few observations and uh, I hate to rain on, um, well, we sort of had a parade here the other day. It was very short. I'm sure many of you watched on TV. Don't want to rain or snow on parades. However, it is worth thinking ahead. We're always trying to think ahead. This shapes the strategy that we'll be employing on this industry's uh, um, priorities uh, heading into this Congress. You know, you can't ignore the fact that there's very strong historical precedent in terms of a change in uh, the majority in the House uh, when it comes to the president's party. So you can see when we talk about the House of Representatives and looking to the midterm in just under two years, um, we'll see how things play out. The political dynamics are, I guess I couldn't say totally unprecedented, but perhaps unprecedented and very unusual when you think about coming through things like the next this impeachment trial we're gonna have. However, House Democrats definitely are um, moving into very strong headwinds politically in terms of their ability to maintain the majority. And obviously with it so close, you're gonna see how that affects um, <clears throat> the appetite of Republicans in the House led by McCarthy to work with Democrats. Um, the other thing I'll just flag, it's, this is a longer term conversation, but I think it's important and this doesn't get discussed enough in my opinion, is when we look at the results of the elections in November, um, you know, looking at the fact that uh, based on how Republicans did, they're, they're continue to be uh, at, gr at a great advantage when it comes to how the census numbers will then be used to uh, do some redrawing or not redrawing of congressional districts around the country. That's a bigger picture thing, but I think it's important to keep in mind and has to be factored into the ability of Democrats uh, to win more seats around the country. So on the Senate side, um, you know, Democrats ended up pulling through um, uh, in Georgia in particular. Amazingly, we saw Senators Ossoff and Warnock, Senator Heinrich's two new uh, colleagues sworn in there. Um, you know, historically, it's, it's not dissimilar. If we go back to 1946, we typically see the uh, members of the Senate who are in the president's party losing seats. It's not as completely predictable. You'll see it's 13 of 19, unlike the 18 of 19 when we're looking at the House. But you can see that's tended to be how things have gone. The thing I would note with the Senate, however, is that Democrats, similar to this last cycle, are actually in a significantly better position to not only hold the seats that are going to be open, but actually take some new seats. Um, just to, to mention a few, um, in which we can actually jump over to the next slide. Um, I was laughing. Um, <laughs> there's a little bit of perhaps wishful thinking on this slide. When you see Ron Johnson there in the lower left, uh, the senator from Wisconsin is not seeking reelection. He has not, in fact, made a decision on that. So uh, the person helping me prepare this slide, I think, was maybe getting ahead of themselves. But you see the big numbers here. Um, when we look at the Democratic majority, they're gonna have 14 seats up. Um, just to flag a few that are gonna be more challenging, Senator Warnock doesn't get to just chill and hang out for six years. Um, he's he's gonna be running again right away. That, that was to fill a vacated seat. And that actually, there'll be a full election for that seat in two years and hanging on to a Democratic seat in Georgia. And as much as it's moving blue, as we've all seen, that's gonna be a tough one for Democrats. Um, the tougher races are for the Republicans. You're gonna note um, um, two, uh, so look at the 20 GOP seats that are up in 22, um, two are actually in seats that, that Biden won, uh, Pennsylvania and Wisconsin. So that's noteworthy. Uh, Senator Toomey from Pennsylvania is stepping away. Now, Wisconsin, as I said, is premature. North Carolina, of course, Trump just barely won a truly purple state, but Senator Burr is, is not gonna run for reelection there. Um, 
you know, other seats, I think people will be keeping an eye on. We're going to wait and see about uh, whether Senator Grassley is going to announce his retirement. He's getting up there in years, even by U.S. Senate standards, and may not run again for that seat from Iowa. And Senator Shelby from Alabama. Um, both red states, Iowa's redder than it used to be, uh, and obviously Alabama very red. Um, so, so that's, you know, I, I would also mention, you know, Arizona is still a closed state, Nevada's a closed state. We all watch the recounts there. Senator Cortez Masto is going to be up in Nevada, so that's a tough one for Democrats. Uh, and Senator Kelly, like Senator Ornock, doesn't get to rest. He's, he's filling his filling out seat. He's going to have to run again soon as well. Rich, we can move off that map. So um, part of the reason we, um, we spend time thinking about Senate cycles in particular, um, as Senator Heinrich and I watched, many of you watched, you know, when senators are in cycle and have tough races in front of them, they tend to behave differently. And uh, you, can, you find yourself with the opportunity to maybe test their commitment to certain issues, things they may have just sort of talked about in a nice way, actually getting them more involved and not just putting their name on a bill but actually going the distance and, and seeing a bill get passed. And uh, no better example of that than what we saw with the Great American, Great American Outdoors Act between Senator Gardner in Colorado, who of course ultimately lost despite his ability to talk about his leadership on GAOA, and then Senator Daines up in Montana, he did win his race. But you, you, those of you in Montana will no doubt have noted how he was touting, I'm sorry, how he was touting uh, his leadership on that bill. Um, I'm just going to mention a couple of things real quick um, before moving on. Um, I think things coming right at us uh, in the near future, you're going to have this interesting um, split screen in the U.S. Senate where they're going to try to move forward uh, expeditiously on uh, confirming uh, President Biden's nominees for all the different agencies. Um, you're also going to have an impeachment trial starting. Um, Senator Schumer said today that uh, uh, the House will actually be transmitting those articles and that touches off a timeline um, that would have the trial starting sooner rather than later. Senator McConnell has been pushing for a delay, um, but looking less and less like that will be the case. Right up in front of us, you're gonna see Senator Heinrich and his colleagues moving to um, contemplating additional relief on the COVID front. Uh, lots of things that weren't done in the deal that was cut in December get taken up. Um, and then uh, the sequencing seems most likely to, to move next to doing some things on infrastructure. Uh, Senator Heinrich, I'm not even gonna try to explain budget reconciliation, nor would I call on you to do that today, but you're gonna hear more and more references to budget reconciliation, which is a tool that can be used um, to get some things passed without getting the 60 votes <clears throat> that you typically need. Um, for legislation and those things have to fall into some somewhat narrow parameters around budget and tax. But you're gonna hear more and more about budget reconciliation and there's some things that can be done on, on issues like climate change. Um, as far as this new administration goes, you know, tremendous opportunities there, obviously, lots of shared priorities. Um, I'm gonna, not gonna go further into that, mindful of my time, but we're very, very excited about um, really getting into collaboration and cooperation uh, with this new administration, particularly in the areas, Senator Heinrich actually laid them out really well, things he's focused on and things this administration's focused on. So we're excited. Yes, we are. Thanks, George. And you, it is a helpful reminder to know that our issues will be on the ballot again in 22. So we look forward to a lot of progress this year and the next, but the outdoors will once again be on the ballot uh, coming up in 2022. I wanna bring Amy uh, Taldi and Jeannie into the conversation about climate, um, particularly want to um, share my thanks and appreciation and praise for Amy and our, our members for developing a climate platform for the first time. Um, so really excited to get to work on that. It's a unique threat to the outdoors. Um, but Senator Heinrich, I want to start with you. Uh, you you know well what the George uh, presented. It's a 50-50 Senate. It's a narrow majority in the House. Um, what are the prospects in your mind for moving climate legislation through Congress? And what do you anticipate the administration will be able to do administratively in addition to this, the first executive orders that came out uh, on, on, the, on January 20th? I think you're going to continue to see uh, a lot of executive action out of this White House. I think they're just getting started with respect to climate. And, um, you know, that, that's a place where uh, it, it really is fairly remarkable, the, the shift, because the last administration wasn't sort of a 50-50 uh, 
you know, we're, we're for some clean things and we're, uh, but we're also still invested in traditional fuels. It was sort of a, a, a complete anomaly worldwide. And so the shift that we're going through, like right in this moment, is, is probably a, a little more jarring just because it's such a contrast. Um, and I think once they get a team in place of a Secretary of Energy, a Secretary of Interior, a Secretary of Commerce, a Secretary of Transportation, uh, what has changed is that we're not going to have a big climate bill every 10 years. We're going to have, we're going to make every bill a climate bill and every agency a climate agency. You know, Pete Buttigieg can do as much on climate in many ways as the Secretary of Energy because he's going to be the guy at the tip of the spear when it comes to uh, investment in forward looking infrastructure. And so many of our climate policies are going to be reliant on a shift in thinking around infrastructure, whether that's electrification of the entire transportation sector, um, you know, whether it's fuel switching within, you know, aviation or other uh, portions of the, the sort of transportation sector. We've reached a point where it's not just in the Energy and Natural Resources Committee anymore. And I think that's a, a big, important shift. Um, and then legislatively, uh, because George mentioned budget reconciliation, we're really going through the rules of that process now to figure out what can be done that, that lives inside that and what has to be done under regular order. Because one of those is a 51 vote prospect and the other is a 60 vote prospect. And those are completely different worlds. So just understanding what's in and what's out there is going to be really key. You know, with respect to a couple of the guardrails I would put in place, especially given the fact that it is a 51 vote prospect with the vice president, is members who are uh, uh, people like Joe Manchin or Democratic members from states that have had historical, uh, what I would call energy veterans, people who have, you know, spent decades providing the kind of energy that we've used historically. Um, to, to be able to get ahead either on budget reconciliation or through the regular order process of passing a standalone piece of legislation, it's going to require, I think, investments in those communities um, in order to get there. And so that, that just gives you an idea of sort of what the negotiation parameters are. But overall, I'm pretty optimistic. I mean, we, we passed an enormous climate change bill at the end of last year with Mitch McConnell in charge of the Senate. Um, you know, we phased out HFCs. That's, that's you know, 1.8 Fahrenheit degrees worldwide if you phase out HFCs. Uh, we made huge investments in research and development and storage. Uh, as these industries grow and, and literally become the dominant portion of the energy sector, they're creating jobs in Republican districts all across the country. So the politics the energy politics is no longer what it was when it was completely driven um, by fossil investments, by oil and gas, and by a few big super PACs. It is becoming more complicated and more diverse, and that allows for a lot more bipartisan work. Every bill is a climate bill, Senator. I think I'm going to make that part of my mantra for the year. Uh, Please steal it. Um, well, Amy, let's talk a little bit about what we're doing uh, as an industry. Of course, our, our goal is to be uh, climate positive by 2050, taking out more carbon than we admit. Um, we're collaborating through the Climate Action Corps to measure and uh, reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions across our operations. Can you talk a little bit about uh, our policy priorities? Yeah, thank you, Rich. And thank you, Senator Heinrich, for joining us and for that golden tweet. We're definitely going to be using that today. Hopefully every bill is a climate bill. Every agency is a climate agency. I love it. Um, so we have basically four industry-wide climate priorities that we developed collaboratively with our members and um, our partners in this space. And they basically fall into two buckets uh, around reducing emissions and then removing or sequestering carbon. Those are sort of two basic strategies to I'm oversimplifying them, but two basic strategies to get to net zero by 2050, which is where science says we need to be. Um, and then all of our, our priorities have, a, uh, particularly three of them have an equity and justice lens um, running through them. So on that first bucket around reduce, you mentioned the Climate Action Corps. 
um, which we're super proud of. We have almost 100 members collaborating through the core, um, working hard to drive down their own carbon footprints and influence other sectors. And a couple of the key priorities that we're pursuing that will help our members accelerate those reductions and also help other sectors who are perhaps larger emitting sectors <laughs> to, to continue to reduce um, are number one, to incentivize um, our members and those companies who are taking action to reduce. And that could be um, you know, tax or tariff relief for a whole range of things like using um, large volumes of recycled content or low carbon materials, um, utilizing low carbon shipping. You mentioned transportation, Senator Heinrich, um, you know, or sourcing 100% renewable energy for their operations. Um, building on renewable energy, like it, it would be a miss to not sort of lend our voice to the chorus on accelerating our nation's transition to renewables and advocating for that. Um, and, and, and for all communities in the US, rural, urban, um, making sure that everyone has access to renewable energy, um, including looking at public lands as a potential solution for renewable energy development where that's appropriate. Um, and then, you know, all sectors need to reduce their emissions, but the fact is we can't get to net zero by 2050 without nature. So our forests, our farms, grasslands, wetlands, um, they are all a large percentage of the potential solution to climate because they sequester carbon. Um, so we have two other priorities kind of in the, that remove category. One is to continue to promote natural climate solutions. So initiatives like the um, 30 by 30 uh, effort that we heard about yesterday. Um, and then last but not least, investing in um, green infrastructure. So things like, you know, more uh, parks and paths, equitable access um, to those parks. Um, those parks, parks in our, you know, urban and rural areas are places to sequester carbon. They also um, help communities build resilience against the impacts of climate change. So we wanna see more of those. Um, and obviously, you know, anything that promotes more biking and walking and access to close to home recreation is uh, provides a carbon benefit as well. So that was quick, but those are kind of our four overarching priorities for the outdoor industry um, to advocate around in the coming years. And, and maybe Taldi and Jeannie can share a few more specifics, specific examples, Rich. Yeah, I think that that's great, Amy. We are the business voice in support of combating climate change. Taldi, let's start with you. What is REI excited about? Uh, yeah, thanks, Rich. I think, you know, we're feeling really optimistic. Um, we have an administration that is committed to and has already taken action on climate. Additionally, both parties agree on the importance of creating sustainable jobs, which so many climate solutions really help accomplish. Uh, additionally, we've seen an increasing number of Republicans that have been open to discussing legislative tactics to address climate change, uh, especially around natural climate solutions. And we're really looking forward to pushing for some ambitious outcomes this year that garner uh, bipartisan support along the way. And that's because REI really believes that addressing the climate crisis is our, our top priority uh, as a business. Um, and we're really excited about the prospect of working with this new administration and our champions in Congress, like the Senator, on actions that both promote greater sequestration and reduce carbon emissions, as Amy mentioned. And we're particularly looking for solutions that have multiple climate, social, and economic benefits. And we really see the greatest opportunity in four areas, um, which Amy kind of touched on. Uh, one is the regreening of our urban and suburban environment to support carbon mitigation and advance public health. We really see that as a twofer. Um, urban forests already sequester 10% of US carbon emissions and increasing tree equity and greening up our built environment also improves quality of life, uh, eliminates intensifying heat islands, especially in historically marginalized communities. Uh, we'd also like to see some bills moving forward uh, that really lean into the use of natural climate solutions to increase sequestration capacity on large tracts of land, um, dominantly in rural areas. And this includes, you know, reforestation, active forest management, and managing innovative use of other terrain for carbon sequestration. And this in increases 
nature's ability to store carbon, but it also has that added benefit of forest health, which is important to quality of life and economic well-being in many rural parts of the country. Our third area is really focused on supporting cleaner alternative modes of transportation, including bicycling, walking, transit, and electrification of vehicles, which again have those health and environmental benefits. The pandemic has really shined a spotlight on the benefits of the active transportation and getting outside. We've seen you know, record setting sales in the bike industry. Um, and the bottom line is that equitable access to multimodal transportation options can improve quality of life while also addressing climate. And then lastly, we're really excited about looking for opportunities to invest in green infrastructure. And I believe that should really include, you know, creating greener buildings, cleaner energy solutions, and as Amy mentioned, using public lands for renewable energies or renewable energy. Uh, this obviously will help deliver jobs while also climate benefits. And again, I think, you know, we're feeling pretty confident that we can make progress on these priorities, um, especially kind of using that same lens that the Senator mentioned that every bill should be a climate bill. Um, and I'm happy if we have time at the end to talk about some of the bills we're excited in the Q&A. Absolutely, Jeannie, I wanna bring you into this, but you know, there are so many stakeholders that are gonna be engaged in climate. Uh, where can outdoor businesses find their voice? How can we lead? Great, thanks so much, Rich. Um, well, first, we, VF and our family of brands, applaud the Biden administration for rejoining the Paris Agreement and restoring critical environmental protections. And as the Biden administration considers additional policies to build back better for a climate resilient recovery, and as Senator Heinrich mentioned, every bill is a climate bill. I love that. <laughs> Outdoor businesses can and should find their voice through advocacy and engagement. For example, we are engaging with lawmakers to let them know the policies that will help us advance our ambitious environmental goals, including our science-based targets and our sustainability strategies that have positive outcomes that align with our purpose of betterment of people and the planet. And echoing Taldi's and Amy's comments, to meet our goals, we will rely on policies and investments to protect biodiversity and public lands. Regenerative and sustainable agriculture incentives will help us address the impacts of raw material extraction which comprise nearly 50% of our carbon impacts. In addition, investments in renewable energy and recycling infrastructure will not only help us work toward our ambitious goals, but also lead to a healthier environment, economic diversity, and new jobs. And in addition, the adoption of key environmental justice measures would slash emissions and better provide cleaner air and water for communities and opportunities for access to outdoor space. And as a purpose-led outdoor activewear company, we have a deep connection to the environment and to environmental protection. We have a responsibility to protect the natural environments we all share and explore and to ensure a sustainable future for the next generations. And now more than ever, this is our opportunity to engage with government and other stakeholders to advocate for critical climate action and environmental protection. And we, as Taldi and Amy and others on this panel have mentioned, are super excited about the road ahead. We've already see, seen positive action and it's only going to be a positive journey as we move forward. Thank you, Jeannie. It just makes me so proud to be an outdoor advocate and listen to outdoor companies really leading the way on climate. Of course, directly tied to our advocacy on climate is what I've always felt is the heartbeat of the industry and in preserving our public lands and waters. So I wanna continue the conversation with Taldi and the Senator and George. Um, you know, you touched on the Great American Outdoors Act, so I wanna begin with what's next. Of course, there are some hiccups along the way with the Trump administration, even up until the last uh, couple of days. So Senator, maybe start with you. What should we be paying attention to um, as a new administration and soon to be Secretary Holland uh, begins implementing the Great American Outdoors Act? Well, I think the first thing we need is to really make sure that uh, the, the next uh, Secretary of Interior, the next uh, Chief of the Forest Service, and those departments focus on the opportunity that's in front of them. And, you know, we had, we, we you know, sadly, we had an administration who cared more about the photo op at the White House than about getting the projects in the queue. And we really need fast, effective, complete execution on this legislation. Uh, there's about $14 billion that lives within the box of the Great American Outdoors Act, split between Interior and, and USDA. 
And that, that's an enormous opportunity for the Biden administration uh, to have a built-in stimulus package, uh, building boat ramps, building access points, refurbishing campgrounds, and all of the things that we use as infrastructure for, to access our public lands, uh, as well as purchasing the new projects that, that if you're gonna do 30 by 30, you can't get there without habitat. It's all about habitat. And that is the pri primary tool with which to protect habitats. And it's the primary tool whereby you can uh, put that park in a community that, that hasn't had the access that we all deserve in terms of local green spaces. So I really think implementation of the Great American Outdoors Act uh, is gonna be absolutely critical to meet the goals that your industry has, that the Biden administration has. And for those of us who represent states, you know, the projects that we wanna see move forward uh, that will benefit our local economies and create opportunities for, for long-term legacy conservation. I couldn't agree more, Senator. And you know, we wanna build on that. And you know, in particular, I think we want to showcase something that you highlighted in your opening remarks to making the outdoors that, that cornerstone of uh, economic recovery. And so I want to bring Taldi back into the conversation. Taldi, how can investments in green infrastructure, close home recreation, a civilian conservation core build on the implementation of the Great America Outdoors Act and help speed this uh, economic recovery from the COVID pandemic? Yeah, I think we all know that the outdoor recreation economy is a major economic engine and multiplier supporting health, economic vitality, and attracting new businesses and professional talent. Uh, we've seen that more than ever uh, in rural America during the pandemic. Our industry, as you guys know, makes up 2.1% of GDP and supports 5.2 million jobs. And so I really think that increasing federal investment in outdoor recreation infrastructure, our industry can be a part of the solution to build back better by supporting jobs and economic growth that will address the needs of these distressed rural communities coming back from the pandemic, including economic development and diversification, increased quality of life, climate resilience, and improved public health outcomes uh, for some under-resourced communities. And programs like the Civilian Conservation Corps that the Senator mentioned earlier can support local jobs to repair and build outdoor spaces while providing job training and diversifying the workforce that will help us build back in those hard hit communities. Ultimately, I think it's time for us to recognize that green infrastructure is critical infrastructure and that outdoor recreation and programs like the CCC should be a part of every conversation about infrastructure, job creation and economic revitalization. Well, I, I think I'm going to steal that uh, line from Taldi, Rich. Green infrastructure is critical infrastructure. Likewise, we need to have a set of t-shirts made for the next in-person outdoor retailer show with all the, the, the slogans we're coming up with. Um, so I want to close out this section, touching again on something that you raised, Senator. You've given us a lot of food for thought and conversation about equity and diversity in the outdoors, and we've seen increase demand uh, for the outdoors. Uh, more Americans are getting outdoors, some for the first time. Um, but all is not equal in this area. And so I was hoping you could expand a little bit on how we can address the gap and really make the outdoors accessible to all. And then Taldi, I would like you to jump in as well. Well, one of the things that I'm really proud that my home state has done, and in fact, one of my former staffers, who's now a city councilor from Las Cruces was at the heart of this, uh, Gabe Vasquez, is create a fund to start very intentionally looking at where those gaps are and find ways to fix uh, that lack of access in, in very granular and specific ways. So, um, you know, something as simple as getting access to, to rental vans so that fourth graders can go do a field trip, um, you know, at their new national monument that they've never been to that's literally only six, seven, eight, ten miles away. So, one, thinking about how we fund these things, but two, also how we do an analysis and, and plug those individual gaps. Uh, that can be the difference, it can be a huge difference for an individual, uh, but then that individual down the line becomes the new advocate, becomes the new workforce. And then you have advocacy and workforce that has grown, the coalition grows, and you have a workforce that represents the entirety of our country. And so um, that is one 
we're trying to work on legislation right now uh, to look at what we've been able to do well in New Mexico and see if we can't scale that in a national way. And I think every company can, can do a little bit of this themselves, especially those that are engaged in, uh, in charitable work and grant making. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think the gap in access to the outdoors is one facet of the larger racial inequities that impact our society, which we've all been called to address more stridently over the past year. Uh, closing this gap requires us to center racial equity in our advocacy work and to approach every policy as an opportunity to level the playing field, to address historic injustices and invest in communities more equitably. Um, I think we all agree that public lands and outdoor spaces should be accessible, safe, and welcoming for everyone, uh, regardless of your race or ethnicity, socioeconomic status, ability, or neighborhood. Um, and in our policy work, and as well as our philanthropy, um, as a senator just suggested, we're really committed to prioritizing increasing access to quality green space close to home, and really starting to tackle eliminating some of those traditional barriers of access um, in this vein, we're currently working on the Outdoors for All Act, as well as permit streamlining through the SOAR Act, um, thanks to the leadership of, of Senator Heinrich, um, as well as increased funding for Every Kid Outdoors and support for the Senator's new effort um, to tackle the concept of maybe a national outdoor equity fund. So really looking forward to working with you, Senator, and your staff on a number of our priorities in this, in this area. That's wonderful. Um, in fact, so thank you, Senator. Thank you, Taldi. Um, the heartbeat of this industry is preserving our public lands and waters. International trade issues, I have to remind everyone, are still critically important uh, to outdoor businesses who are innovators and in developing uh, the latest gear to enhance the outdoor experience. So I do want to bring into the conversation uh, my old friend and colleague, uh, Mike Ratchford uh, from W.O. Gore. Um, Mike, you're a veteran of Delaware politics. <laughs> Uh, you've been with Gore for a number of years, a Delaware company. You know President Biden. Um, what can you share with us about him? Well, um, uh, thank you, Rich. Uh, first of all, let me say um, how good it is to see Senator Heinrich here. Uh, he's been such a champion for the industry. And Senator, good to see you. Not Thanks, used Mike. to seeing you in a suit like that. but uh, <laughs> I, and, I don't uh, prefer it this way. <laughs> So, um, Rich, I've been a constituent of uh, uh, President Biden uh, in Delaware. He's just known as Joe um, for, uh, for uh, a number of years. And I worked for a, a governor of Delaware and a member of Congress. And um, in working in Congress, all the stories about uh, uh, President Biden taking the train on a daily basis are absolutely true. You'd see him on the platform in the morning at 6.30, 7 o'clock and, and coming back at night. And I'll also say what a delight it was to work with him and his staff. Um, the country is fortunate to have somebody of his integrity and character and uh, with really good values um, uh, leading the country now. Um, also thinking about him and the outdoor, um, he, I think his outdoor, preferred outdoor recreation is golf. Although um, as vice president, he bought a uh, house in uh, uh, Rehoboth uh, Beach and he's taken up bicycling with his family on the Gordon uh, Ponds Trail. So uh, uh, I know he enjoys get, getting on the outside. So uh, it's, it's really good to see him where he is. We, we look forward to, to working with him and hopefully having that chance to bring some of our members and you know, constituents on a bike ride with him uh, this term. Um, but Mike, yeah, let, let's touch on trade. Um, the outdoor industry certainly has faced a number of challenges over the past few years from the U.S.-China trade war to the global pandemic. And even there's a threat of additional putative tariffs on outdoor products coming out of mm -hmm. Vietnam. Um, from your perspective, how did outdoor companies respond and how the experiences of the past few years influenced supply chain's decisions moving forward? So I think on balance, the industry has responded well. I mean, when I think about COVID, the first um, April to June were rough on everybody, right? We're all trying, trying to figure it out. But I'm really struck by uh, the resiliency within the industry. Uh, for example, the way uh, retailers responded um, um, by opening stores safely or going to online. Um, if, and also the way um, some of the manufacturers and suppliers look to supply personal protective equipment, uh, you know, masks and thing, things like that. 
Um, I think one of the good sides of, of the COVID is it really encouraged people to get uh, outside. Um, you know, a lot of cabin fever and the ability to get outside was important. Um, and um, Taldi mentioned this, but it also reminds us of the importance of close to home outdoor recreation, you know, just being able to go to a local park or things like that. And um, so that's the positive side of things. Um, on the trade war, uh, that too has been a challenge, uh, particularly for uh, a lot of the smaller members and particularly being able to shift uh, very quickly um, or to have to um, uh, follow where the trade policies were going in Washington. You know, announcing policies by tweets, not, uh, not a good way to, to proceed. And uh, a lot of the time, the processes, I think about the 301 processes, Rich, and the time that you spent on that, uh, were kind of convoluted, not clear. So, um, but on whole, I, I think we've done okay. I, I want to mention something on that, Mike. It, it just, it wasn't clear what the goal was for the last four years. And so even if you have very different opinions about, um, uh, about trade and, and about where things should be sourced and what's critical and what's not, it wasn't clear what the, the goal was and what the parameters were. And I think just having an administration that whatever their, their viewpoint is going to be, that they're very honest and transparent with those of us in Congress and those of us in the industry so that you can plan for how to deal with that. That, that has great value. And I, I wanna say thank you to the industry for stepping up at a key moment. Um, you know, Early on in the pandemic, there was a move by some elected officials, some governors uh, to shut off access to outdoor spaces. Um, and the, the industry really stepped up and said, here's how you recreate responsibly. And uh, I, you know, if we would have lost some of the access points to our public lands in New Mexico, I would have lost my, my mind. Uh, and, and most of my constituents were in the same boat. So I'm really grateful to the industry to, for providing that responsible voice early on when things could have gone very differently than they ended up going. Well said, Senator. Thank you for that. So, Senator, well, I should I also mention the importance of the COVID relief plan. Um, for uh, for the industry for for that so that's that those were very helpful too I know Mike you know we the way we responded over the past four years and looking ahead was through our balanced trade agenda that you well know we support domestic manufacturers and we support relief for companies that source from abroad on products that aren't produced domestically why is this why has this been so key to you know the success that we've had and why is it so key to uh, the trade program moving forward with you know a president who you know, has made clear that you know domestic priorities are going to be his priority right out of the gate. Why does balanced trade um, fit this industry and has been key to our success? So you know, really, balanced trade. Balanced trade means that we look to work with to source domestically where we can, but where we can't, look for tariff relief on things that that would be unique and and we know are not made in. And so that has become the cornerstone, uh, Rich. I think of our trade policy. And as a result of that, it gives OIA tremendous um, credibility in the trade arena, arena. And it stood the test of time. And I think in particular, in thinking about balanced trade in the administration, Senator, the way um, you know, uh, Build Back America is such a central theme of the Biden campaign, he's very sincere about that. I think that puts us in a good position uh, on this. I mean, we've got credibility. We um, bring forth policies. You know, we, we've got a reputation of only pursuing things um, that aren't made here in America, going through a rigorous process like the MTB to determine those. And along the way, if we do find out that there are products that are made in the U.S., then we've, we've backed away. We've been very reasonable on it. And I contrast that with others who may have taken, you know, may have uh, shot from the moon on, on their policy. So I've always felt very good about our balanced trade agenda. I think it's very reflective of the ethos of the industry. And I think it's something we could all be comfortable and proud of. Yeah, absolutely, Mike. You know, and Senator, I think we are looking forward to prompt action on renewing the GSP program on moving those package and miscellaneous tariff bills. So we very much look forward to that uh, early in this uh, session. 
Um, I do want to preserve some time. We have about five minutes left. So I want to get to at least a couple of questions as we've had a comprehensive uh, conversation. Um, so I want to start uh, with, uh, for the, and for the group, so other folks can please um, jump back on camera. Uh, what is a compelling message from a business perspective on climate change that can appeal to Republicans, uh, perhaps more conservative Democrats? I think this is going to be you know, critical for us as a, the business voice uh, for the outdoors on this issue. Is that for me, Rich, or? Yeah, please, Senator, start, yes. Just, I, I think it's a jobs message. There's an opportunity here. And um, that, that when you look at where uh, we are creating new jobs, it is very much in, in the, the lane of solving the climate crisis. So uh, I, I think the more they see the reality of those jobs, there was a disservice done for a long time to sow doubt. Um, but when you have, you know, just in, in the energy industry, someplace else, I, I spent a lot of time working. Uh, I now have these communities that have um, wind turbines in their backyard. And so their neighbor, they now know that this is a real job. Their neighbor works as a wind tech on these things. So as the jobs angle, uh, becomes real for people, whether those are recreation jobs, whether those are manufacturing jobs, uh, all of those things just change the tenor of the conversation with my Republican colleagues. Any others want to jump in? Um, yeah, just I totally agree. I mean, that's been my experience so far in working with Republican colleagues here at our firm. Um, you're seeing, as Senator Heinrich actually hit on this earlier, you got to remember the manufacturing piece too, right? So if in your district or the state you're representing, you're actually starting to see manufacturing jobs that completely changes the attitudes of, of Republicans. We have one more question here um, from the audience. Would pushing for subsidies be a good direction to promote investment into green infrastructure? Senator Talby, do you want to take that? Senator, you go first. Um, I, I think I'd, I'd have to understand better how those would be structured. Um, I, I've seen incentives work really well, and I've seen incentive programs that, that did, weren't effective. And so, um, you know, off the top of my head, I, I'd, I'd have to think about that some more before I just jump in with both feet. That was partially why I punted to you first. Um, I, feel the I same. would say <laughs> one of the one of the ways you can incentivize green infrastructure that doesn't require passing new laws and that there is enormous latitude to do is just use the procurement code of the biggest customer in our country, which is the federal government, to incentivize infrastructure being green when you're investing in infrastructure. So if you're thinking about like giving a leg up, for example, to concrete that, that uh, sequesters carbon, as opposed to traditional concrete, which is, has an enormous um, carbon footprint. Those are the places where without even passing a law, you can, you can have an enormous difference. Taldi, we'd have just a couple minutes left. So quickly, I know you want to touch on some other pieces of legislation we'll be tracking and supporting in this year. Do you want to quickly touch on those? Um, sure. We mentioned a couple of them um, throughout the conversation, um, but a few other bills that we're interested in specifically right now is the Replant Act. Um, it's a bipartisan, bicameral bill, um, and the bill hasn't been reintroduced this Congress, but um, we've talked to the sponsors and it's coming soon. And the bill would lift the cap on the reforestation trust fund to increase reforestation efforts on Forest Service lands. Um, so we're feeling really optimistic. Um, it's, it's not asking for any new money. It's, it's just redirecting uh, money that already comes in through the Reforestation Trust Fund and having the bipartisan support in both chambers last Congress. Um, it was in the negotiations up till the end uh, with the final package that passed. And so we're hopeful we can see this bill uh, come to life as it'll be a really important part of increasing natural climate solutions for the US. Um, you know, we'll also be looking at the FAST Act, uh, which is, to get wonky, the transportation bill. Um, but there's some great provisions and opportunities in there uh, for non-motorized recreation. 
uh, and really increasing trail infrastructure um, as well as electric vehicles um, or incentives for electric vehicles. And so our community will be really tracking that and, and working on the FAST Act to help ensure that we get some climate solutions as well as equity um, included into the FAST Act this Congress. Um, we're also following uh, what was once the Outdoors for All Act, um, specifically around the Outdoor Recreation Legacy Partnership or ORLP program. Um, it's a bit wonky and a mouthful, but ultimately the ORLP program uh, at the end of the year, Congress uh, redirected uh, historically, you know, 125 million to invest in the program. And the, the program is really focused on um, providing grants uh, to urban parks and historically underserved communities. And at the 11th hour, literally the day before, um, the Trump administration rerouted those ORLP funds into an LWCF general operating fund. And so we'll be working with the administration and our friends on the Hill to, to try and right that wrong um, in the coming weeks. And I'll leave it at that. Well, thank you, Taldi. And unfortunately, we're at the hour. So I have to end the conversation today. Thank you, Senator Heinrich, for joining us. Thank you, Mike, George, Jeannie, uh, Amy, and Taldi for just a wonderful conversation. Contact me to learn more about how you can get involved in support of the outdoors and get so many of these key priorities across the finish line. Uh, so take care, everyone. And when we can, be safe in the meantime, but we, when we can, we look forward to having you in Washington, D.C. Uh, soon and run around the hill with uh, myself and George. So take care, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.